Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Krause, and I'm the manager here at Pet Food Shop. I'd like to thank everybody for coming out on this beautiful night. Um, we won't, we'll get rolling very quickly here. Um, for this seminar, uh, Sian Laverty will be presenting. She works for D&D Commodities. Um, she's done a number of these talks as an avid birder in her own right, which you'll find out in short order. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Sian. Good evening, everybody. Um, what we're going to start off with is I, I do have a little movie to show. What it's going to do is show you the common birds of the area. It's going to actually play the song that they sing right before the bird. It is good to learn the songs of the birds because a lot of times you hear them long before you see them. I can't tell you how many times during the springtime when the Orioles come back, I hear him. And I, I, it takes me about two weeks to finally spot him. But you know their songs and you know they're in the area. So we play a little bit of their song and then it talks about how to identify them and then what we recommend to feed. Afterwards, I'm gonna go into how to choose the right food because what you put in your feeders does matter. Uh, the different types of feeders, how to choose them, how to care for them. And then we're gonna go, of course, get into our favorite subject, Sammy the Squirrel. Everybody loves him. And then we'll talk about nesting, nesting boxes, uh, the importance of water, and we'll even touch on hummingbirds, even though they've gone south now. So we'll miss them, but they'll be back next year. The black-capped chickadee. The black-capped chickadee has white on its wings and is slightly larger than the Carolina chickadee. Its range consists mostly of northeastern United States. The black-capped chickadee prefers the hopper feeder, the platform feeder, and the small tube feeder. The black-capped chickadee is attractive to the Wild Delight Advanced Formula line, including the woodpecker, nuthatch, and chickadee blend. The Dark Guy Junko. The male dark eyed juncos have gray coloring, white bellies, and bright black eyes. Females are more brown overall. Juncos live in flocks and migrate to southern areas in the winter. Their range consists throughout North America. The dark eyed junco prefers the ground feeder. The dark eyed junco is attracted to the Wild Delight Advanced Formula line, including the Gourmet Outdoor Pet Food Blend. The purple finch. The male purple finch is a deep red, while the female is brownish and has a white stripe above the side. They prefer open groves. Their range consists mostly of the Gulf Coast and the California areas in the winter, migrating north in the summer. They prefer the small tube feeder, the finch sock feeder, and a hopper feeder. The house finch. The house finch is the most common type of finch. The female is the same brown as the purple finch with an eye stripe, but the house finch is not as bright purple as the purple finch. Its range consists anywhere in the United States except the Great Plains. It prefers a small tube feeder, a finch sock feeder, and a hopper feeder. The American Goldfinch. The female American Goldfinch is actually a duller olive yellow, while the male is a bright yellow. They inhabit patches of thistles, weeds, open woods, and garden areas. Their range consists mostly of southern Canada to southern United States. The American Goldfinch prefers the small tube feeder as well as the finch sock feeder. All finches enjoy wild delight blends, including the golden finch food, and special finch food blend from the Advanced Formula line, as well as the Nitro Seed from the Natural Formula line. The Tufted 
titmouse. The tufted titmouse is the only titmouse found east of Texas. Its most distinguishing feature is the pointed feathers on its head, and its main color is gray with a pale stomach. Its range is eastern and southern central United States. The tufted titmouse prefers the platform feeder, a hopper feeder, and a large tube feeder. The tufted titmouse is attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including its nut and berry and fruit and berry blend. The White Breasted Nuthatch The White Breasted Nuthatch is the largest of the nuthatch family. They have gray backs with a black head. Its face and belly are white. Its range is most parts of the United States except for some areas of the plains and the southwest. They prefer a hopper feeder or a large tube feeder. The Red Breasted Nuthatch The female Red Breasted Nuthatch is duller in color than the male. They inhabit forest and mountainous regions. They have two stripes by their eyes, white is above the eye, and black goes through it. Their range consists of Canada to western and northeastern United States. The red-breasted nuthatch prefers the platform feeder, hopper feeder, or the large tube feeder. Both the white and red-breasted nuthatch are attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including the woodpecker, nuthatch, and chickadee blend. The Cardinal. The male Cardinal is entirely red with a black face mask extending from lores to eyes and down to the upper chest. The female Cardinal is buff brown with some red on wings and tail. They prefer woodland edges and gardens. The range consists of eastern United States from Canada to the Gulf States. The Cardinal prefers the hopper feeder, the platform feeder, and the large tube feeder. The Cardinal is attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including the Cardinal Food Blend. The Indigo Bunting The female indigo bunting is brown with blue on her toe, while the male is a brilliant blue. They are most commonly found in hedgerows and woods. Their range consists of central and eastern United States. They prefer the hopper feeder and the platform feeder. Indigo buntings are attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including its golden finch food blend. The Blue Jay Both the male and female blue jay are blue and white and comparable in size. They inhabit oak and pine woods, gardens, and towns. They range in east of the Rockies from Canada to the Gulf States. The Blue Jay prefers the platform feeder, the hopper feeder, and the large tube feeder. The Blue Jays are attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including deck, porch, and patio blend. The Rose Breasted Grosby. The appearance of the female rose-breasted grosbeak is similar to a sparrow except for the red breast. They inhabit woods, orchards, and thickets. The range is southern Canada and eastern United States to the southern United States. The rose-breasted grosbeak prefers the hopper feeder, the large tube feeder, and a platform feeder. The evening grosbeak. The female evening grosbeak is smaller than the male, and instead of white patches on its wings like the male, the female has yellow on its nape and sides. They are often found in trees and shrubs. The range is southern Canada and western United States throughout the year. The evening grosbeak prefers the hopper feeder, the large tube feeder, and the platform feeder. Both the evening grosbeak and the rose-breasted grosbeak are attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including deck porch and patio blend and the songbird blend. The pine siskin. The male 
female are similar with yellow on their wings and under their tails. They do not have a pattern of migration, but they move in flocks between 100 and 200 birds. Their range is southern North America in winter and northern and western North America in the summer. The pine siskin prefers the large and small tube feeder as well as the finch sock feeder. The pine siskin is attracted to wild delight's advanced formula line, including the golden pitch food blend. The white throated sparrow. The female white throated sparrow is similar to the male. They prefer woodland undergrowth. The white throated sparrow prefers the hopper feeder, the large tube feeder, and the platform feeder. The white throated sparrow is attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including the songbird wind. The Hermit Thrush The Hermit Thrush has an olive brown back and rusty colored tail. They are mainly found in northern woodland. Their range consists of northern and western United States and Canada in the summer, and southern and eastern United States in the winter. They prefer the platform feeder. Hermit thrushes are attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including the cardinal food blend. Red-bellied woodpecker. Red-bellied woodpeckers have hard black and white feathers with a bright red head from their bills to the back of their neck. Females have a splash of red from its crown to its neck. The range is eastern United States. The red-bellied woodpecker prefers the hopper feeder, the platform feeder, and the wire mesh feeder. The hairy woodpecker. Hairy woodpeckers look very similar to downy woodpeckers, except they are larger in body size and they have longer and bigger bills. Their range is throughout the United States, except for some small areas in the South. The hairy woodpecker prefers the hopper feeder, the platform feeder, or the wire mesh feeder. The downy woodpecker. The main difference between the female and male downy woodpecker is the red markings on the male's head. They inhabit shade trees. Their range is typically Alaska and Canada to the southern United States. The downy woodpecker prefers the hopper feeder, the platform feeder, or the wire mesh feeder. The red belly, the hairy, and the downy woodpeckers are all attracted to Wild Delight's advanced formula line, including the woodpecker, nuthatch, and chickadee blend. Morning dove. The female morning dove is the same color and size as the male. They inhabit farms, towns, open woods, and grasslands. They range from southern Alaska and Canada to the Gulf states. The morning dove prefers the platform feeder and the ground feeder. <coughs> the gambler's quail. The gambler's quail is a pear-shaped bird with short legs and roundish wings. Both male and female are gray colored above and buff colored below. Males have a black throat and face and have a head plume, called a top knot, a red cap and a white headband. Females have a less prominent plume and lack black colorization and a red head cap. The gambler's quail has a 14 inch wingspan and an average weight of 6 ounces. They range in Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, California, and Nevada in the United States and in Mexico. The gambles quail prefers the platform feeder and the ground feeder. The morning dove and the gambles quail are both attracted to Wild Delight's wildlife formula, including the dove and quail food blend. <coughs> the Canada Goose 
The male and female Canada goose are similar with a black head and neck with white cheeks. They migrate day and night, staying near water from Canada and the northern United States to the southern United States for the winter. Their range consists of southern and northwestern United States and Canada. The Canada goose prefers the platform feeder and the ground feeder. <laughs> The mallard duck. The mallard is the most common type of duck. It lives in ponds, lakes, and marshes. The female's molten brown color is different than the male with his green head, white neck, and brownish chest. They range in Canada and the United States in the summer, northern central United States all year, and southern United States in the winter. The mallard duck prefers the platform feeder and the ground feeder. Both the Canada goose and the mallard duck are attracted to Wild Delight's wildlife formula, including the crunchy nut squirrel food blend. The gray squirrel. Although not a bird, the squirrels can be commonly found in one's backyard. The gray squirrel is the most common of the tree squirrels and are found throughout most of the northern hemisphere. Gray squirrels are, on average, 15 inches long and weigh approximately one pound. Squirrels are known for their ability to plan for the future, spending fall gathering nuts and seeds so that they have enough food to last throughout the winter. The gray squirrels prefer the squirrel feeder, platform feeder, suitable feed dish, or the ground feeder. The gray squirrel is attracted to Wild Delight's wildlife formula, including the crunch and nut squirrel food blend. We hope you have enjoyed this video. It gives you a glimpse into your backyard feeding experience and the possibilities of capturing those golden moments. Whether you want to attract a cardinal, indigo bunting, black cat chickadee, or an American goldfinch, Wild Delight is the proven leader in creating a place to call home for your birds and other outdoor pets. I hope you enjoyed that. That was just a little glimpse into some of our common birds of the area. Now, what I'd like to start off with is the kind of food that you should be looking for to put in your feeders. It really does make a difference what you buy. There's a lot of companies out there. There's a lot of deception, too. So knowing what you're buying will give you the best, you know, experience at your feeders. What is the most number one preferred seed by the widest variety of birds? Black of sunflower, absolutely. It's, and you want a nice sunflower. When you're, you're looking at black oil, now black oil many years ago used to be relatively inexpensive. You could get a 40 pound bag for what, 10, 12 dollars? Now it's, what's it up to now? Well, that is down. Yeah, we, we had a very good crop this year. It's, it's a commodity item. So it does fluctuate with uh, supply and demand. If there's a, a bad crop, of course, the price is going to go up. And a few years ago, to eliminate trans fats out of food, a lot of companies started switching to using sunflower oil. So the demand went up. Uh, about three years ago, Russia had a crop failure. And why does that affect us? Well, China was buying their sunflower from Russia. Well, now they had to buy from us. Everything is supply and demand. So the price went up. So the days of the inexpensive sunflower are gone. So if you go to a store and you find a 25 pound bag and it's a really, really cheap price, buyer beware. Because a few years ago, before actually before I started working with this company, I went to one of those mass market stores. They had 25 pound bag, really good price. Oh, I had to buy it because birds love sunflower. I brought it home. I ripped it open. Number one, there was enough sticks in it to make a small fire. And it was dirty, and it was dusty, and it, it was disgusting. Yeah, and I was, I was like, well, I'll never buy it again, but since I have it, let me put it out. The birds didn't even want it. They're kicking it out of the feeder. It's got, I'm just like, well, wait a minute. You're supposed to love sunflower. So I go out there, and I'm picking up what looks like unopened seed, squeezing it. It's hollow. 
it's old seed. Because a couple of things can happen when seed gets old, and there, there is a shelf life on seed. Either that kernel inside can dry up, or if you look real close and there's a little pinhole in there, there's something to, called a sawtooth brain beetle, and they're larvae. Go into the, into the seed, eat everything, come right back out. So it's old seed. So just because it's a really good price doesn't mean you should buy it. Because if the birds are going to fling out, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent of it, you didn't save anything. Now you've got a mess. You're not getting the results that you want. Know what you're buying. Read the ingredient panel. I like to avoid mixes that have cracked corn in it. Very few birds like it, and the ones who do like it, you really don't want at your feeders, especially Sammy the squirrel. He likes that a lot, too. Um, Red Milo, what eats it? Yeah, it gets thrown all over the place, doesn't it? Almost nothing eats it. Uh, squirrels will eat it, chipmunks will eat it, starlings, grackles, the birds you really don't want at your feeders. I'm not even a really a big fan of white millet. Some birds like it, you know, your sparrows will like it, maybe a couple of your finch birds will like it. But it's, to me, it's not a big attractant like you would with starting off with sunflower. Um, if you're looking for a mix with fruit in it, make sure it actually has fruit in it. I've read some ingredient panels, and oh yeah, it says fruit and, you know, fruit and berry on the um, label, and you read the label, it's a fruit flavor. Your average song, I mean, human beings have, what, five, over 5,000 taste buds. Your average songbird has only about 50. So they're not being attracted by the flavor. They're not being attracted by the smell. It smells good to us, but they don't smell it. So it's not going to bring you to your feeders. Birds are visual. So if you want a fruit formula, make sure it's got fruit in it. I've also seen some weird stuff thrown into bird foods, you know, barley, wheat, oats. Just because it's a seed doesn't mean a bird's going to eat it. And if you see birds, they're flinging it out. You know, I mean, birds are messy, but what they're doing is they're rooting around for what they really want. Birds need to eat their weight in food every day for optimal health, and they want the, high, they want the fatty fat stuff, sunflower, peanuts, you know, nice fruits and stuff like that to give them that, that fat, that energy to keep them going. You know, the saying, the saying, you eat like a bird, it's really not a compliment because that's how much birds need to eat. So you, you, you want to find a good mix. I've seen um, on the ingredient panel grit. Some companies will throw grit in their mix because they say, well, birds need to eat grit to help digest their food, which it is true, but birds know where to go to eat dirt. They're not coming to your feeders looking for it. They know where to go to scrounge it up. So you're just wasting your money because grit just adds weight to the bag so you get less product. I've even seen different types of oils like vegetable oils and stuff like that. What some companies do is spray vegetable oil on the seed to make it look clean, you know, and keep the dust down. But it also adds weight to the bag. So you want, you want a good clean mix, but you, you know, you want real, you know, real fruits, real nuts, real sunflower. And look for date codes on the bag. You also want fresh product. Because the older the product, the more likely it, you know, birds are not going to eat it. Um, what else? Niger seed. Niger seed, you want to have a nice black color to the niger seed. If it's starting to look dull or even brown, it's old. And there's just an itty bitty little seed in there, and that dries up pretty quickly. The finches won't eat it. So you're wasting your money. So the key is know what you're buying. Then feeders. How many have more than one feeder in their yard? <laughs> I like seeing those hands. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those. Yeah, you know, depending on the feeder, you know, birds, certain birds go to certain feeders. Like your average tube feeder, a lot of times the perches are not big enough for cardinals and people want to attract cardinals to their yard. So they need something with a bigger landing platform. The bigger the bird, the more of a landing platform they need so they can turn and feed comfortably. 
like a lot of times, hopper feet. Well, this is a small hopper feeder, but they have bigger ones. I have in my, it's a good to have a different types of feeders in your yard because you'll get more birds. I have a tube feeder. I have a platform feeder. I have a hopper feeder. I've got a finch tube, and I've got four socks up. Yes, I cater to them all. But it's like all season long, I get all these different variety of birds. And I have the feeders scattered out throughout my yard, so they all have kind of like have their, their space. But when you're looking for a feeder, there are a couple things you should look for. I mean, there's a lot of very decorative or what I call foo-foo feeders out there. I, I look for two things in a feeder. Is it easy to fill? Is it easy to clean? Because you do need to clean it. There are a lot of companies are starting to get on board and make it easy to clean. And am I, am I not going to be able to open this? There we go. Bottoms come off, tops come off. There's some that the ports come out. And when you wash them, I'm not a big fan of using any type of detergent. I mean, I had somebody tell me, oh, I just put it in some bleach and water. Ooh, I just cringe, you know. If you, if, you, if you want to use any type of detergent, and I'm not trying to advocate, you know, any particular brand, but Dawn Soap is one of your safest ones. But what I do is I wash everything in white vinegar. White vinegar and hot water. White vinegar is an antibacterial. And it also rinses clean. Plus, I love the smell of vinegar. I clean everything with white vinegar. So that's what you want. You, you want to have a variety of feeders. You want to be able to fill them easily, clean them easily. And you should clean them periodically. Depending on, you know, what kind of mixes you use. You know, if you get a very dusty mix, all that dust ends up in the feeders. It accumulates. It'll clog the feeders. Um, you should always check your feeders after a rainstorm <laughs> because a lot of times that moisture will get into these ports, even the, even the thistle tubes with the little, little slit there, moisture can get in there. It can actually clump and clog and get the seed wet. If you don't check on it and leave the seed wet for a few days, the seed can go rancid and it can make your whole feeder toxic. Now, you don't have to throw the seed out just because it gets wet. If you get to it right away, what I usually do is I open up a piece of newspaper, dump the feeder out, spread the seed out, and let it air dry. And while the feeder's down, I inspect it, brush it. If it needs to be cleaned, I clean it. So every few weeks, you should clean your feeders. I have a constant, I have a lot of feeders at home, so I have a constant rotation of feeders. Yeah, I, I, I've become my mother. I really have. She was the bird lady. That's what I grew up with. You know, I always thought my mother was nuts. And I always swore that I would not become like her. We do, don't we? We become just like her. So I, I now carry the mantle of being the crazy bird lady. So, but I'm not okay with that because it's what brings us joy. And, you know, the, the more components to birding that you can put together, the more success you're going to have in your yard. Any questions? Come on, I love questions. I love questions. I'm away all week. Yeah, I'm usually, well, because of my job, I travel all week. So I'm usually gone from Monday through Friday, sometimes Saturday. So by having multiples of feeders, I, it usually lasts for a good week. And that's where having a good mix in your feeder benefits you because the birds aren't kicking it out and wasting it all over the ground. The food will actually last longer in your feeders. I mean, we've got some mixes. I fill my one five pound feeder. It'll last all week because the birds are actually consuming it and not wasting it. So yeah, I fill up all my feeders first thing Monday morning. And yeah, when I get home, yeah, they're, they're a bit low and the birds are like, come on, fill it up. You know, cause birds get to recognize you when you're out in your yard and stuff. And yeah, they do talk to me. I am not crazy. <laughs> they do, you know, and, and a lot of people are like, oh, I would love it if, you know, one would land on my hand. I get my black cap chickadee landing on my feeder as I'm filling it. That's how comfortable they become with you if you're out, you know, you're out in your yard. And yes, and I, I do talk back to them. 
So please do not send the men with the white coats after me. I'm not crazy. But this, this is the joy we get. So good food, a variety of feeders, change your feed, you know, clean your feeders often. Another important component is water. You know, birds need water, especially in the winter time. Where do we put, oh, well, of course, I put it underneath here. They have a lot of different types of bird baths. I have, I have two heated bird baths in my yard. I call them my birdie jacuzzis. Because even in the winter time, when everything is frozen, birds need water. They not only need to drink the water, but they need to bathe to keep their feathers clean of dirt and oil so they can fly properly. Years ago, the heated bird baths were, were a little dangerous because you always had to make sure that they had to be filled with water. If they ever ran dry, they would melt. Nowadays, they are a lot safer. So if they happen to run dry, you don't have to worry about damaging the feed, um, the bird bath. So they do have whole units. They have, where do we put everything? Didn't we bring the, um, this you can mount to your a deck, a pole. You know, oh, that's a whole nother subject, cats. Yeah, I would, I would, birds need a nice elevated place to feel safe. I mean, even if you live on a lake or a river, I live on a lake, I still have two elevated bird baths because there is a lot of predation out there. And you wouldn't believe what will try and snag a bird. My mother had um, built herself a pond, and for years she was putting tadpoles in there because she loved frogs. Well, she got her wish she had frogs. Bullfrogs. These bullfrogs did not stay in the pond. They came out into her garden and actually were going to her, where her feeders were and nailing birds that were on the ground and eating birds. Bullfrogs. Only my mother could raise killer bullfrogs. <laughs> I'm telling you. So yes, there, there is a lot of danger on the ground. So if you can have it elevated, all the better. Gives them a safe place to go. Um, cats, cats are now a big problem, and it's such a shame that they have become basically the number one throwaway pet, you know, and cats do what cats do. I mean, my cat is an indoor cat, but he'll, st he'll lay on the back of the sofa looking at the bird bath, and he gives that cat chatter. No matter what, the, the cat is a cat, you know, so you would want to keep anything, bird feeders or anything, away from, you know, eight to 10 feet away from shrubbery, because if the birds are on the ground, cats, where do cats hide? Underneath the shrubbery, and they're gonna come zooming out. Now, what my mother had done, is she ever see the, the garden edging fences? She took some, and she made a ring around her feeders, so the cats didn't have a straightaway. It bought them a little bit of time. You know, it wasn't perfect, but it was something to do because there's no leash law on cats and they're just, they're cats. You know, it's the same thing a lot of people are worried about hawks. You know, they feel bad if a hawk gets a bird at their feeder because, oh, you know, I feel bad, I put, you know, I'm like ringing the dinner bell for these hawks. Well, it's natural. A hawk is gonna get a bird, whether at your feeders or out in the open, if they're just going to. You know, so like, like I said, eight to 10 feet away from any shrubbery so the bird can go into the shrubbery. You know, it's, it's just natural. You know, it's, 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 to me, hawks are a sign of a healthy ecosystem. And they, they are a beautiful bird, but I do feel bad when they get a bird. Why do they always get the most beautiful birds? Why can't they get a starling or something, you know? They have to get the, the cardinal or the goldfinch, you know, the, the, the pretty birds. Oh, but water is definitely an important component. And you should, during the, especially during the summertime, wash it periodically because especially if it's in the sun, algae will grow in there. Again, white vinegar and hot water. Just put it in there, swish it around with a brush, and rinse it out and fill it up. And you're ready to go. Any questions? An exterminator, if you didn't hear, an exterminator asked, told her to keep her feeders away from the house because the feeders will attract mice. 
you know, they can. You know, it all depends on the food. If you got, uh, if you're putting a basic supermarket blend in there and the birds are kicking it out all over the ground, it's a smorgasbord. It's going to attract things you don't want in your yard. Aside from squirrels, chipmunks, mice, rats, possums, raccoon, deer, turkey, by me, bear. You know, so you want to mix that the birds aren't going to waste all over the ground. So if there's nothing on the ground for them to eat, plus, you know, you really should clean up under your feeders periodically anyway. So, I mean, do you, uh, do you have a mice problem in the area or do you live near fields? Yeah, it can. It can. So I probably, you know, probably would heed that a little bit. But just using a better mix so the mixes aren't thrown on the ground would probably help as well. Who else had a question? Suet? There. Well, you know, it's funny. Um, the suet that they, uh, my mother used to go to the supermarket to get the, and the butchers used to just give you that beef fat until they discovered they could make money off of it. Now they started charging it. The charging part. So, um, yes, my mother used the beef fat from the supermarkets all the time. And what she, she used to make her own suet. She used to run it through a grinder, make it into a gruel. And then she used to mix it with peanut butter and bird seed. And yeah, she made this, this funky looking gruel. And she used to, um, she had a, a log with holes in it. And she used to pack it in there. She had a maple tree with some knot holes in it. She used to pack it in there pack it into pine cones and hang it into trees. So yeah, you can use the regular, you know, butcher fat. But I mean, there's, there are so many different suet cakes out there. You know, it's, it's suet is, I feed suet year round. You know, some people don't want to feed in the summertime because they worry about it dripping and melting and stuff. Well, if you get a good quality suet, it doesn't do that. But birds want that fat, again, fatty fat fat. They need to keep that metabolism up. And the woodpeckers just love the suet. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You get a white, and the nuthatches love it. I've seen the, the chickadee on it, the titmouse on it. So you will get a wide variety because they, they want that fatty, fat, fat. And I just want to put it out there. Woodpeckers do not kill trees. Because a lot of people think woodpeckers kill trees. Yeah, but a lot of times when they're, when they're pecking on a tree, they're going after, there's already a problem with the tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but a lot of people are like, I don't want woodpeckers around my trees and stuff. They kill the trees and stuff like that. And I usually, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if it, what, they're going for bugs. So if they're pecking on your tree, there's already a problem. There's like, they're like your early warning system that there's a problem that you need to address. But I, I love the woodpeckers, you know. They talk to me. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, let's see, let's see. We talked about food, feeders, waterer, nesting boxes. Do we want to get into nesting boxes? I mean, I know the season is over. Um, you should all clean out your nesting boxes after each season. And I usually spray white vinegar in there and wipe it. <laughs> what a surprise. There you go, white vinegar again. <laughs> because um, birds do carry mites. Mites don't die off in the winter. So if you don't clean your box out, what can happen is they stay in the nest, especially if you leave the nesting material, they stay in that nesting material, they multiply. And then as the, when the bird lays their eggs and the babies hatch, the, mi the mice mites infest the baby and actually can kill the baby. So yeah, and you know, I, I, like, all ne I like nesting boxes that open, so you can do just that to clean them out. And I mean, you can wait until, you know, like February to do so. You know, depending on my schedule, I either clean them out in the fall or I do them right in February and get them ready. Um, in the springtime, you can put out an assortment of different nesting materials, different natural yarns and straw. Um, and what's the best is dog hair. Dog hair. I had two German shepherds. 
What do German shepherds do best? They shed. And I'll tell you, my mother and I used to fight over who's going to brush the dogs because she wanted the hair to put in her yard and I wanted the hair to put in my yard. I'm surprised my dogs didn't go bald. But what I, I would do is I would actually take a sewer, empty sewer cage and put the material in there and hang it up so it's not blowing all over the place or under the, you know, getting lost. But dog hair, it's warm and it dries well. Don't use dryer lint. If you use fabric softening sheets and stuff, don't use the dryer lint because the chemicals from the dryer lint, you know, from the fabric sheet, get into the lint. So it's not very healthy for the birds. Oh, you had 30 bluebirds? Oh, you are so lucky. Bluebirds need a specific box with a specific size hole, and it's important to set the boxes up correctly. They should be along a tree line facing an open area. The boxes should be at least six feet off the ground, five, six feet off the ground, and the entrance needs to be facing east to southeast because all your bad weather comes from this way, so it's a way to protect. Bluebirds are a little fussy. But the biggest complaint I get about bluebird boxes is that you know who else loves to nest in bluebird boxes? Sparrows. I mean, birding is not set in stone. What a bird does in your yard may not happen in your yard. And you know, try different things, experiment, see what they do. I mean, that's what nature is. And birds can be quite adaptable. I mean, I had a, um, they'll nest almost anywhere. I had, in the springtime, I put my house plants out and I had a hanging, one hanging by my front door, and every time I went out, a bird flew away. And before I knew it, I'm looking, there was a nest on it. It was, it was a robin made her nest on it. And she had three little eggs in there, and I got to watch, I got to, because I'm nosy, I'm gonna peek, and you got to see the babies and everything like that. Well, mine left me without saying, Goodbye, thank you, nothing. I came home, they were gone. Nothing, no thanks. Yeah, but she, she got used to me. She actually, uh, because it's my front door, I'm going in and out of it, she would actually sit there and I'm just like, oh, I talk to her. Yes, I, I talk to them. But you know, they will, I can't tell you how many times people have told me about how wrens may nest in the wreaths on their doors and stuff like that, in mailboxes. Now the, the house wren, he is the hardest working bird out there. The male bird builds anywhere from three to four different nests. And then he brings his female around for her to inspect and choose the nest she likes. And if she don't like it, she tears it apart. And I tell you, I was watching, because he picked up one of the boxes in my yard, and I watched him, he's in there on the tree, tree limb going, as his, his mate is in there checking out the nesting box, and I'm looking, all of a sudden she starts ripping it apart, and I'm just like, oh, that poor bird. <laughs> he's he's got to make another nest. But she is, she is very demanding. The tunnels for the bluebird boxes, they are also called predator guards. Um, a friend of mine, she lives in upstate New York. They, they have bluebirds, and they asked me to get them some predator guards, and it's, it's a tube that fits over the entrance to the hole, so it's, it's a, it's a three-inch tube that comes out. Because bluebirds are crevice-dwelling birds, so they're not afraid to go in and through, whereas other birds are a little hesitant to do so. And they said it actually helped keep the sparrows out of the bluebird boxes. Now, the house sparrows, if they do get into the bluebird box and they make a nest, I would wait until the female lays three, four eggs, then open up the box and pull the nest out, wait till she lays her allotment, and then pull the nest out. And the, the house sparrow is not indigenous to the United States. It's an introduced bird, and it's an invasive species. So don't feel bad about it. I mean, we, we, you hate to, you know, discard eggs, but they're just having a negative. You can agitate the eggs. We do that to, um, we do that with the Canadian geese. You know, we got a permit to agitate the eggs because if you take the eggs away, she's just gonna keep laying. You know, so you could agitate the eggs. That's a little egg. I mean, cedar waxwings generally are in flocks of 20 to 40, and they are traditionally fruit-eating birds, 
So if you can plant um, fruit-bearing bushes and shrubs and stuff, what's Mountain that? Ash right Mountain here. ash. Yeah. yeah, I mean that'll help bring them in. Honeysuckle. Do they really? Well, you got to try and get them to stay. You know, that's that's the whole joy. I mean, I actually now have the rosy-breasted grosbeak staying in the area. For years now, I've had the Oriole nesting in the area. Now, I, I, him, I give grape jelly. And they actually, you have them. They have jelly, jelly feeders made just for the feeding of jelly for Orioles. Now, mine are a little spoiled because they have to have Welch's grape jelly. <laughs> because one time they were eating it so fast because the cat bird likes the jelly as well that I went to the supermarket, the, they had the store brand on sale, I bought it, put it out there, wouldn't touch it. Nope, gotta have that Welch's. Oh. All right. Nice. Yeah, a water feature in your yard is, is fabulous. Uh, you know, bird bats are great. If you can have some sort, somewhere moving water or the sound of water, that brings them in. You'll even get birds that are not seed-eating birds because all birds need water. It's an old wives' tale that our parents used to tell us that if a baby bird fell out of the nest, don't touch it because the female, the mother will smell your hands on it. Birds don't have that kind of sense of smell. So it's an old wives' tale to get us kids not to get involved. There might have been a reason why that baby fell out of the nest. Maybe it got pushed out by you know, stronger siblings. I mean, you know, as human beings, we want to help the weak and the helpless, but it's, you know, natural selection, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's the mother instinct. She is going to cry. So you can try putting it up in a bucket, you know, maybe she, you know, if you can hang it in a safe place, you know, that she can continue to feed it. But that, that is a tough one. If you can't get it back in the nest, it's a very hard. A lot of times when birds uh, hit into your window, what they're seeing is the reflection of trees. So they're thinking it's continuation. So they do sell decals and stuff you can put in the window to kind of break that up a little bit. It's not 100% foolproof, but it can help. Because uh, I get birds hitting my window all the time, and I've got a big stained glass you know, picture hanging in there, and they still fly into the window. They, they don't understand what windows are. And plus, if you get it nice and clean, it looks real good. <laughs> but a lot of times they're just stunned. Right. Or you can call this gentleman over here. He'll come over and give it CPR. <laughs> but we want to talk about Sammy the squirrel. Who loves their squirrels? All right, we got some squirrel lovers here. You either love them or you hate them. So the number one question people ask me is, how do you get rid of the squirrels? You don't. You can only manage them. And I'll tell you, I've had people tell me some really creative ways that they've come up with to keep the squirrels off their feeders. It's hysterical. And I, I'm going to... Yeah, there you go. I'm going to tell you right now, there is no such thing as a squirrel-proof feeder. I call them squirrel slower downers, and some actually work better than others. I've got two at home that I've had up for seven years now. I've never had a squirrel on. So there are some that are effective. Others, you know, there's always that one that figures it out. Yeah. So they have all sorts of cages. I mean, these are nice, but sometimes you can limit what birds actually get to the feeders. You do have weight-activated ones. These can be effective. The ones I have at home, one is called the Squirrel Buster. It's a weight-activated. It's from Brome. And then I've got from Droll Yankee, I have their Dipper. They make, actually make four of them. They make the whipper, dipper, tipper, flipper. I've been in this industry way too long. <laughs> They're very effective. 
I mean, the, the one that you were talking about, the flipper. My, I had given one to my mother for Christmas, and the squirrels actually learned not to even bother with that feeder anymore, that she didn't even have to charge the battery anymore. They just left it alone. So it can be effective. I mean, I've had some guys tell me, oh, I just shoot them with the BB gun. Oh, I don't want to hear that. Please don't, you know. I've had other people tell me, I take axle grease and grease up the pole. Oh, dear God. The best way to do is squirrel-proof your area as best as possible. If you're doing a pole-mounted feeder, that pole needs to be 8 to 10 feet away from anything they can get up on and launch themselves. And you need to put a baffle. One like this, or this one's even nicer. At least five feet. If you got some ones that are really acrobatic, up it a little bit, you know, adjust it. And it could be very effective. Uh, if you're hanging a feeder, again, that feeder should be at least five feet off the ground. Squirrel baffle, eight to 10 feet away from anything they can get on and launch themselves. And yeah, you set up a squirrel feeding station away from your main feeders, and put the inexpensive stuff there, you know, the corn, which they love. Um, ooh, where I even, You could even give them something to play on, the squirrel around, that spins around as they, give them something to do. Keep them busy. But, you know, because squirrels are extremely smart, but they are kind of lazy. So if they had their choice of fighting that baffle and everything like that, or hopping up over there for a nice, easy meal, they're going for the easy meal. And you can have peace in your yard. The birds can have their food, they can have their food, and you can have harmony. You can also, if you, if you can't set up a feeder or a baffle correctly, you can actually mix cayenne pepper in the seed. Um, the active ingredient in cayenne pepper is capsaicin, and what activates that burn is saliva. Birds don't have saliva. So they'll get a flavor, they won't get the burn. But squirrels are mammals and they're not too fond of it. Once in a while I've had people tell me, oh, my squirrel got used to it. So, you know, you got some squirrels that like Mexican food, you know, a little spicy and stuff. But it can be effective. But I, I do advocate, you know, squirrel proofing the area and then giving them their own place to go to eat. And their own water and everything, make them their own little space. My mother used to have one that actually climbed up on her foot so she could hand him a peanut. This is what I grew up with. Now, I mean, some people say that they will only feed safflower because the squirrels won't eat it. Yeah, they will. If there's nothing else around, they will begrudgingly eat it. They're hungry. They're going to eat to survive. Oh, last winter was terrible. But the only problem with feeding just safflower is that very few birds can actually open that shell. If you ever know, it's a favorite food of the cardinals, but if you look at the size, of the, the shape and size of the cardinal's beak, it is designed to crack open that shell. It's a very, very hard shell. So a lot of birds can't seem to handle it. So you really reduce the amount of birds that you get in your yard if you just do safflower. So I like variety. You know, safflower, sunflower, peanuts, fruit, everything. Put it on out there. But that, I mean, this is the joy of, of feeding, getting, interacting with nature. You know, I mean, they get to know you. They get, to, they get a little demanding, don't they? You know, my, my woodpecker, um, he used to be the one that ate the oranges. And he didn't just eat the orange, leave it, and go to the next one. He would pull off the peg, throw it on the ground, and say, I want another one. This one's empty. Very demanding. Very demanding. All right, trivia question. What bird has legs but does not walk? Aha, I'm going to stump you on that. Hummingbird. Hummingbird. They have legs and they do not walk. They flip, you know, they flip back and forth. Our hummingbirds have left for the season. You know, so I hope everybody took their feeders in have cleaned them for the winter with white vinegar and hot water. There goes the white vinegar again. Get all that mold and stuff out of there. Hopefully you don't have all that. And get them ready for, you know, for next year. There's a wonderful website, www.hummingbirds.net. 
I usually start checking it in at the end of February because there's a migration map on there that sh people will post their sightings. And you can watch their movement up the East Coast. Because a lot of people ask me, when should you put out your hummingbird feeder? I mean, I've had people say, oh, I, I put it out in July. Too late. Because everybody thinks it's got to be 80, 85 degrees for hummingbirds. Now, I'm from northwestern New Jersey. Rule of thumb in my area is by tax day, April 15th. You should have a feeder out. But I checked this website because they move with the weather. Because you'll see postings and their movement. All of a sudden, if a cold front comes down, it stops. So if we have an early spring and it gets warmer sooner, I'll get them in my yard sooner. I usually get them about March 26th to the 28th. I usually see my first one. And you get the same ones back. Because I was, I was at my kitchens and I'm looking out the window and I had the empty shepherd's hook where I always put my feeder. There's a hummingbird going, zip, 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 going, where's my food? It's, they remember you. And let me tell you, they are brave. You know, they are, they are like little Napoleons in the yard. You know, that is their territory, their yard. When the forsythias bloom, you should have a feeder out. Because that, too, is another one of the first flowers that they feed on. So I put a variety of different agastachys, salvias, budleas. Budleas multiply in my yard like crazy. I've already given six away because they just keep popping up throughout my yard. But they love them. And that brings them in. You know, a lot of people say, well, I've never had a hummingbird in my yard. You know, how can I get them? Number one, you got to get your feeder out there early. If you don't have any, any flowers blooming, you know, buy a, a, a hanging basket with reds and yellow flowers in there because you have to advertise. Again, birds are very visual. So you want to catch them when they're moving through. Because usually the first ones that come through, are they keep moving. They go as far north as Canada. And then you get your resident ones coming and they stick around. At one time, I had about 15 hummingbirds in my yard, and they, I tell you, it was downright dangerous to, to walk through my yard because they don't watch where they're going when they're flying and where they're chasing each other. It's been the ruby-throated is east of the Mississippi, but because of um, destruction of habitat, you know, like Hurricane Katrina destroyed uh, that whole habitat there, um, the change in climate, uh, with people more gardening and feeding and attracting them. I had an anise in my yard and a rufous sided. And uh, someone in eastern Ohio had a bumblebee hummingbird. Now, there's another little critter that flits through the yard that everybody thinks is either a hummingbird or a baby hummingbird, the sphinx moth. Yeah, I get a lot of those, and they are the coolest thing. But the coolest experience I had was one night when I let my dog out. I had clomies. Everybody, anybody know what clomies are? Um, what is the common name? Spider plant? Um, they, they, the, the leaves. The leaves do. They um, reproduce in my yard like there's no tomorrow. So, and they grow mutant, too. They get about this tall, arms, and everything. They're beautiful. But one night, I, had, uh, I was out with my dog, and I had something big come down and flip through them. I thought it was a bat. And it flew off, so I didn't get a really good look. A couple nights later, again, I, w I was out there, and here it comes again. This time, it, it kind of stayed. I got closer. It wasn't a bat. It turned out it was the giant sphinx moth. It's big. It's big. Wingspan and everything, it's big. And it's nocturnal. It only comes out at night. Oh, I just gave myself goosebumps. Oh, they're beautiful. It's beautiful, you know? I mean, it's just when you get something new in your yard, it's exciting. Yeah. It was, well, at nighttime, it looked, it was like a brownish color. It, it fluttered. It flew just like a, a regular hummingbird. But I usually make my own mixture, and it's one part sugar to four parts water. I do boil the water. You know, some people say you don't have to. I like to boil the water because I want to make sure 
that the mixture, the sugar actually dissolves. Um, do not go to the supermarket and buy red food coloring. It is the wrong coloring. It's toxic to the birds. So just leave it clear. And then, you know, a lot of people want to know how often you should change it. It all depends on the temperature outside and whether that feeder is in the sun or not. Because if it says 70 degrees out and it's in partial shade, you could get five to seven days out of it. As the temperature goes up to 80, you knock a couple days off. When it hits 90, 95, if it's sitting in the sun, you're going to want to change that just about every other day. Because the sun heats that sugar in there and actually turns it into like an alcohol. So you can actually get a bunch of drunk hummingbirds all over the place. They run, and I'll tell you, they, they do get to know you, because I've had them buzz me and chick, 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 and challenge me. They're challenging me. I've had them challenge my dog. Yeah, and he's just sitting there going, what? You know, and they're right in his face. They don't care. They don't know that they're little birds. You know, and, and you know, a lot of people, you know, the rule of thumb is supposed to be um, if you're setting up multiple feeders, you should set them up out of line of sight of the other one. Because even though this one hummingbird's got this whole feeder all to himself, if he sees another one over there, he's going for him. Truthfully, I like to watch them chase each other. <laughs> I'm just one of them. But I have about eight feeders up in my yard, you know. And I leave them out until about mid-October. Because you'll get the stragglers coming through, and I just want to make sure that they have a little something and no, when they, when they migrate down to South America and stuff, they do not ride on the back of geese across the Gulf of Mexico. That is a wives' tale. They actually do fly across the Gulf. And then, they, of course, they go down through Mexico, Yucatan Peninsula, and stuff like that. They are a very, very tough little bird. The whole East Coast is one of the biggest migratory paths for birds. I mean, we live in a great area. You know, so all the birds that come through, it's just phenomenal. It's just, you know, I mean, birding, we just want to get them to stop in our yard so we can look at them. Because people are like, you know, well, in the springtime, there's plenty for them to eat. Not really. You know, seeds haven't been, a, you know, developed enough. And, you know, if we have a season with no snow, which can happen, you know, birds are naturally foraging. So there is no food for the migratory birds when they come back. You know, so feeding them actually helps them. I mean, we've destroyed their habitat. We polluted the area. There's enough stresses on these birds. You know, feeding them actually helps. They're not going to de become dependent on your feeder. They only um, derive about 20% of their diet from your feeders. They, go, they naturally forage. I mean, I've got all these feeders up in my yard, and yet I've still got birds flipping over leaves and stuff, foraging. It's just in their natural habit to do. So feeding, and I feed year-round, just gets them, just helps them out a bit, gets them to stop, so you can you can look at them and enjoy them, and that's what birding is all about. Did I cover everything? How'd I do? Yay! Thank you.